My name is Ben. I work for University Extension. I think you know Extension is like the 4-H people, right? I, I wasn't in 4-H. I mean, I don't work in 4-H. Um, I'm a rural sociologist. My, uh, my undergrad was in math and statistics. I'm a data geek. You're going to see a bunch of data here. Uh, and before your eyes all gloss over because of that, I would like to remind you that I am here to help you understand data. So hopefully everything you uh, hear today will be understandable, consumable, and take homeable, which I don't know if that's a word, but it's going to be a word. So you see the title of the presentation here is Rewriting the Rural Narrative. The premise behind my life's work is that the narrative we use to describe our small towns and rural places is terrible. It's not written by us, it's written for us by someone else. And so I, I, I've done these studies over a number of years. My undergrad was, as I said, math and stats. I went to school in the small, in what, at the time, why I considered a small town of just 5,000 people, where now it's like, holy cow, 5,000 people, that's a good sized town, right? So I went to school in Morris, and I found out how easy it was to get involved in social life. I was in the Eagles, I was in the Red Cross, and I realized I probably wanted to have a future here. And uh, I started to get involved doing rural development work with some faculty and doing economic development studies, and started to realize there are actually all these groups across rural America doing work in and for small towns, groups like foundations like NCF, or the you know, Extension is out there, and we've got all these kind of nebulous groups who, as a student, Going to the University of Minnesota, I thought, you know, you go to college and you go to work for a private company. And this opened my eyes to realize there's a, actually a whole world of potential employment that I could kind of dig into here. So what we want to talk about here today is moving in, moving out, moving over. It's really, you know, getting into the dynamics of change in our rural communities. So when I started doing this work in like the mid-90s, as an academic, I want to read books, I want to read articles, and of course, what do I find in the books and articles? I find books like The Decline of Rural Minnesota, Fighting for the American Countryside, Survival of Rural America, Hollowing Out the Middle. Like, all of these are pretty terrible, right? And the narrative is so bad, I kind of went back to my boss at the time, so I was the first employee at the Center for Small Towns. And after six months or so, I went to my boss, I was like, Roger, with all the towns dying, like, are, am I just going to be like a critical care assistant to help our small towns die in a respectful way? Like, I want to help you go out nicely, you know, not, so, not too much faith, right? But it, this narrative was not matching up with what I'm hearing on the ground, with what I'm seeing on the ground. Like, there's people, there's vibrant communities, there's people passionate, there's people involved, and this wasn't connecting for me. And it didn't make a lot of sense to have the doom and gloom on one side and then hope and opportunity and vibrancy on the other. So, I want to introduce a term to you called anecdata. Anecdata is information which is presented as if it's based on serious research, when in fact it's based on what somebody thinks is true. <laughs> now, you'll notice the word anecdote is in there. An anecdote, uh, as a statistician, I'll remind you that the plural of anecdote is not trend. The plural of anecdote is not data, hardly, right? You get three people sitting around the coffee table talking about how bad your town is. That's not a trend in your town. That's three people that are talking badly about your town. Now, you all are in positions that you talk positively about your rural communities, and many times people say you're Pollyannish. Well, of course you're talking positively. You work for the chamber, right? I'm going to give you plenty of ammunition. My last name is Winchester, right? I'm going to give you plenty of ammunition for you to go home with to talk positively about your rural communities for good reason. Now, that's not to say we haven't gone through tremendous negative changes in our rural communities. We're still undergoing those today. The mechanization of agriculture in the early 1900s reduced the number of farm workers by 20 to 80 percent in some places. You started to see how rural populations decline in the early 1900s. At the same time, roads and transportation systems transformed our small towns and rural places, and it mostly transformed how our small towns connected to one another. So we literally went from Little House on the Prairie to not Little House on the Prairie in about 15 to 17 years. So you went from, right, Little House on the Prairie, if you, you live in Walnut Grove and you have to get to the doctor in Mankato, for those of you that saw Little House on the Prairie, right? It would take you a day to get there because you're in a horse and wagon. You've got to get to Mankato. It takes you a day to get there. And now you might as well spend two to three days there because you just took a day to get there. So now that one doctor's trip took four to five days. Where now with vehicles, I'm there and back in a day. 
We, during this time, you see it, start to see the rise of regional centers. You see this kind of idealism toward our vanity. Everybody wants to be the one-stop shop. You start to see literally family fortunes invested into main streets, which were almost, in the end, guaranteed to have a bunch of losers. Because not every town was going to be a winner in this race for urbanity at the time. Now, Main Street restructuring, this is a really kind way of saying business is closed. Hardware stores, grocery stores, apothecaries, gas stations, right? This is part of the narrative we have today. I remember when we used to have three gas stations, and now we only have one. And almost all the time, you look at the headlines back in your newspapers, you see, if we close our grocery store, our small town's going to die. We close our hardware store, our small town's going to die. Like all of these are, led by, are left with proclamations that were just, this is just another nail in the coffin, right? And you see remnants of this even today, right? You've got boarded up buildings in many of small towns. You've got empty bank buildings, or where that's where the hardware store used to be. And it's really easy when you live there even. We lived in Hancock for 12 years, and literally two weeks after I moved to Hancock, I go into the grocery store, and there's two loaves of bread. And I asked the owner, and she's like, we're closing up shop. I was like, dang it. Now I've got to shop in Morris, which is 10 miles away, right? I've got to go grocery shopping to Morris. And it's easy, again, to think another nail in the coffin, another nail in the coffin. Now, I want to remind you that every time you hear of a hardware store closing in Shelby, there's one that closed in Lincoln, too. These are trends of globalization, and nobody is immune to this. Right? When these changes occur... It has a negative impact on the psyche and the identity because now, like, right, if you're, if you're in a bigger city, you've got all these other options and you kind of notice that one going out because it might have been your favorite one. But if you close a hardware store or a grocery store in your small town, it's probably your only one. And now you have to drive past it every day and remind yourself about, about what used to be. School consolidations, too, in the 80s and 90s, we started to see a rise in those. Many of you have probably participated in this, right? Consolidating schools. And there's a lot of hand wringing at the time where if it wasn't for open enrollment, if it wasn't for school, or if it wasn't for private schools, right? Like eating away at our numbers. Well, the number one reason why schools consolidated is the birth rate. When your outgoing class of seniors is 20 kids and your incoming class is 14, you just lost six, right? Because we're infatuated with total numbers, our enrollments go down, and right now, this is actually something you have control over. Like globalization and things impacting your main street and the rise of big box retailers and all the dollar stores, that we have very little control over. But birth rate, in a way, you do have control over. So you can go home and start encouraging pro-fertility days <laughs> and bump up your kindergarten enrollments. We've got a lot of discussions lately about changes, too, around like post offices. So uh, the McKnight Foundation commissioned me to do a study of, in Minnesota about how do the metropolitan media portray rural Minnesota. So we looked whenever, you know, it's small, as we looked at the Minneapolis Star Tribune, the Pioneer Press out of St. Paul, Minnesota Public Radio, all these other sources in the metro about how they talked about rural in Minnesota. And while a majority of the stories were about plant closures, tornadoes, you know, murders that woke up the sleepy town, right? It wasn't good. A majority of the stories were not good for our small towns. And really, whenever you talked about things that were good, it was seen as the exception. Like, I can't believe John started a business in Hancock. Well, if the backdrop behind rural is all negative, when something good happens, it is the exception. So now we've got this exceptional coverage of rural. So one of the things that I did do in this study was I talked to reporters and I asked them, like, what time of day did you go to Klontar for Ely, Minnesota, or Hancock, or whatever it was? And the average time of day that reporters got out of the metro to greater Minnesota was between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Well, they didn't want to fight traffic, right, getting out of the cities. So they waited, and obviously now we live in these kind of regional economies. A majority of our jobs don't actually exist in our towns. They exist in the regional centers. So now, when the reporter goes to a small town, what do they find? Not much. Like, I wonder if I have the picture here. Like, there's a picture up there um, above Main Street restructuring. That's Sleepy Eye, Minnesota. And, right, it's like cars filling Main Street. You got people walking up and down. Like, this Norman Rockwellish view of what rural should be doesn't exist. It rarely does. So, meanwhile, again, the reporter goes into the town and may see, like, a boarded up bank building. Might see where the school used to be. And it just harkens back to the narrative that rural is dying. Right? So what's the reporter do? 
goes into the cafe, and who do you find in the cafe? All the retired folks who talk about how life used to be. <laughs> Our narrative is built upon what we had, what we could have had, what we should have had, what we wish we had, and very rarely do we recognize all of what we are and all of how we've changed over the years. I can't tell you how many towns have a narrative like, we could have had 3M in our town 40 years ago if the council would have just rezoned that land north of the highway. Why do I hear this in like 60 towns across the country? Like 3M looked at three. And there was no place in Nebraska they looked, right? So meanwhile, why do we have this kind of narrative that harkens back on the past? I argue that we have it because we aren't where we believe we should be. So we want to blame it on something. We want to look back and like give some reason that somebody in the past made the decision to explain where we are today. So meanwhile, we have had recent discussions about post offices closing. So the reporters go to Calumet, Minnesota, which is west of Duluth. And of course, people love talking to reporters. What you see ended up in the newspaper ends up as a very distilled version of all of these kind of comments that people have together with the bias of the reporter, because we've all got these biases, right? So now, you end up with a headline like this. It says, Iron Range Town, fighting for more than the mail. So now this article wanted to talk about what's the impact going to have, what is going to be the impact in this town of closing the post office. Now, the reporter usually doesn't write the headline and the byline, but here's the byline. Calumet challenges the decision to close its post office, which is a social hub for its residents. I was like, social hub? <laughs> like, we never hung out in the post office in Hancock. There's no coffee or rolls. And this is funny until you think of the three quarters of a million people I just read it. Three quarters of a million people now believe you hung out in the post office. <laughs> it's not true. So one thing I do want to say is that if all of these negative changes were going to cause the death of our town, show me all the dead towns. They're not there, and for good reason. At the same time, why can't I find a house to buy in rural Nebraska, rural Iowa, rural Minnesota? It is almost impossible. Don't you see the inequity between I can't find a house to rural is dying? <laughs> now, I like the Mark Twain quote here, room is my death, been greatly exaggerated. Rural is changing, it's not dying, so what's going on? Since 1970, the rural population has not gone down, it's gone up by 11%. What's gone down is a relative percentage of Americans that live in a small town in a rural place. So in 1970, one in four people lived rural, in a rural place or a small town. But by 2010, it's down to one in five. And how can that be? I thought the rural populations went up. Yep, while the rural population went up by 11%, the urban growth rate was 50, like 48, right? So that results in a relative percentage decline. But this is almost the headline you see everywhere. People prefer urban life. Now, when you look around your metros, too, how many counties used to compose your major metropolitan areas? It used to be like two core, one or two core counties were your metro 100 years ago, and then it grew to four, and now six, right? Urban areas have not grown taller, they've grown wider. So what happens when people have a preference for low-density living? They move out to the suburbs. We see this in every metropolitan area in the country. It's called the concentric ring growth around urban areas. You see the first ring suburbs. But then the 60s, 70s, 80s, people are like, I don't want to live in the city, I want to move out. And they go out to the first ring suburbs, and they're like, well, you're urban too. So they move out to the second ring, and we start to see this growth. Now what happens to my rural data? It looks like rural populations just went down because that county just got reclassified from rural to urban. You're welcome, urbanity, right? For us doing so well, you took our people away from us. It impacts our rural data. This rural growth rate is 11% despite urbanity taking away another 14%. It is not that people have a preference for urban living, it's that they don't. No. One more term I want to introduce is total population infatuation. Usually everybody loves the total population, right? You've got a sign outside of town. And the new census is coming out too in a couple of years. So you're going to find out, like Hancock, Minnesota, like our sign went from 777 to 755 from 2000 2010, right? So we are big losers. Because if your population goes down, you're a loser. And if it goes up, you're a winner, right? So the counties in white here are the big losers. You've got tons of losers in Nebraska. You're all losers, right? We're going to talk. I mean, this makes sense. 
So one of the first data points I ran across when I was looking into this total population infatuation was five counties in western Minnesota where their population from 1960 to 2010 went down by 35%. Huge losers. But the number of occupied households went up by 3.5%. How can that be? Average household size has went down. Now, how does this happen? During one time period, you may have had 2.7 average kids, and now we're down to 1.7, right? So even if you have 10 homes in your county or in your city, it used to be that those 10 homes would be home to 360 people. Now those same 10 homes are going to be home to 260 people, solely because average household size went down. Average household size since 1940 went down from 3.6 to 2.6. You are going to lose 29% of your population just by existing in this world. This is demographic destiny. So if you have lost less than 30%, you're doing pretty good. Now, we are actually going to see a continuation of the population losses in many of our rural communities because of this one simple fact. We have two senior spouses in many households right now. What happens when one senior passes? You're left with one surviving spouse, and they usually stay in the house. So now what happened? Your population just went down by one, but your occupied household stayed the same because, right? You just lost one person, but they're still in that house. Or you may have had two kids graduate over this time period. Like Bill and Cherry's kids graduated. That's my parents' name. Bill and Cherry, Ben and Beth moved out. Your population just went down by two. The number of occupied households stayed the same because those kids weren't homeowners. Now, if you all are totally infatuated with population, the moment Bill and Sherry's kids move out, you should be like, hey, you don't mind if we have two strangers move into your house because we've got to keep our numbers up. <laughs> Think of all the really unique strategies you would have if that's, your, if that's what you're looking for. So, you look at, I just picked a couple counties out here, like Boyd County, your population between 2000 and 2010 went down by 14%, but the number of housing units only went down by 1%. Frontier County lost 11% of your population, but number of houses went up by 2%. Valley, again, you're all losers. These are all loser counties according to population. But your housing keeps stable or grows at a rate that you probably didn't expect it to grow. So, I wanted to better understand years ago who's really moving in and who's moving out. That book earlier, Hollowing Out the Middle, uh, looks at the, you know, the encouragement of our young towns that when, uh, when our young, smart students uh, graduate that they leave and apparently this is a huge problem that when you, this is called the brain drain right when you're 18 year olds when they graduate they leave and this is I mean this is somehow deemed a problem in my industry because we call it the brain drains uh, we got a bunch of brain drain places thank you negative narrative right you ask an educator if it's a failure that their kids off and go into the greater world and you know find something for themselves do they call that a failure are you calling your teachers a failure because this happens? Like, what are you going to do? I mean, what's your strategy here then? You want to counter the brain drain? You're going to tell your 18-year-olds they can't leave town? Like, you want to build more resentment in your 18-year-olds? Tell them they can't leave. <laughs> so meanwhile, every five years, about half of your residents move. I'll say it again. Every five years, almost half of Nebraska residents move. They may move to a different place in town or out to the country or from the country to the city or to another state or to China. We don't know. But people move all the time. So we have this continued flux of people in and out of our small towns. Well, a majority of the research in our rural development industry has been focused on the outflow. I wanted to look at the inflow. And what we found is there are people in their 30s and 40s, sometimes in their 50s, but that's not everywhere. Jeff mentioned it earlier, that are net gainers in 30 to 50-year-olds. And so we call this the brain gain. And we've done interviews and focus groups with these newcomers, and we, you know, we wanted to better understand why did they move here. And when I first compiled the data, I called my colleague, you may know him, Randy Cantrell, who recently retired, and, and he works for Univer University Extension. And I was like, Randy, there's apparently people, even in the panhandle of Nebraska, where you lose 10 to 15% of your population, there's a net gain of people in their 30s and 40s and 50s moving in. And then as good academics, we're like, we've got to get a grant. And so we started to study and do interviews and focus groups with newcomers, people who moved in the past five years. Why did people move, we asked. The top three reasons were, number one was a slower pace of life. Number two was safety and security, which was especially high with people with kids. And the third top reason was the low cost of housing. A job was not in the top five in Nebraska. It wasn't in the top ten in Minnesota. 
So economic developers, they didn't know what to do with this because ED folks are usually like job first approach. Well, a job first approach is what I call a warm body mentality. Like you don't care who you get then, we just gotta fill the jobs. This is why we talk about people recruitment. As we are entering the tightest labor market we have almost ever known, labor is going to have power. And they're going to have the ability to choose your town or your town or your town. And what's going to matter between those towns is not the job, it's everything but the job. So if all your HR folks do to recruit people into their small towns is like, show them here's the shop floor and here's the software or the tools we use for your job and here's you know, the pay and the benefits, well, that's going to look roughly the same. We have to help people envision their lives here. We have a county in Minnesota, Ottertail County. They hired the nation's first rural rebound initiative coordinator. It's his job to help people envision their lives there. Take the kids to the school. Find a potential job for the spouse, the trailing spouse. Find, you know, let people go fishing for an hour. Like literally take people out fishing for an hour. Like that is enough to like, man, I love this place. <laughs> now. Who are these people? Just a third of the newcomers are from your town. Returnees, right? Boomerangers is another way to talk about it. Put on its head, two thirds of people moving to your small towns are not from there. Then it really opens the door to how welcoming is your community, right? Both of these groups have challenges. Like the folks that you know, grew up there and moved away and came back, they've got their own challenges, right? I mean, they've, it's a lot easier because they've got social networks in place, but at the same time, they've got what we call familial baggage, because they're from there. It's like, I remember in third grade when you break the, or broke those windows, and you're like, I'm 37. Like, I, I don't, that's not who I am anymore. You don't even, right? But the new people, who have no previous contact with your town are very limited. Who do they go to at 1 a.m. when their pipe bursts? What if they need emergency daycare? Like, when's the last time we had a newcomer over for a meal? Right? We started this program called Grab a Bite program, which is every small town has an ambassador, and whenever we find out about a new person, we take them out to lunch. And the number one rule is the Ben Winchester rule, you can't ask them for anything. Not sit on the board, not for money, no nothing, right? So, what we also found is 51% of the kids have, or 51% of the newcomer households have kids. So, right, if you have kids, like I've got an eight-year-old and a five-year-old, and if there's a new kid in their class, it's easy to recognize, like, oh, there's a new family in town. But I'll remind you, every time you find that kind of low-hanging fruit, like there's that household, there's going to be another one you may not ever see. And they may not walk into your chamber, they may not walk into your community organizations. Yet, what are they told when they get into town? Why would you ever move here? You're not really from here until you've been here for 30 years. This negative narrative has to stop. This is their town now, too, right? Now, how about brain gain, right? They're bringing in job skills. These people are in their prime earning years, and they have chosen. Nobody's forcing these people to move, right? They have chosen to move to your town. And they're bringing with them their education, their networks, their social networks, their economic networks, their career, and they love your town. At the same time, I would get asked all the time, like, well, if there's all these new people here, where are they? They're not in my groups. I'm like, right, they're not in your groups, they're in theirs. And you're not showing up at their meetings. So before you start bad-talking these young people and where they decide to spend their time, you should be careful about the language. Here in Nebraska, while your population went up by 7%, the number of nonprofits went up by 9%. We've got a continued churn of the types of groups that you've got in your community. There's new nonprofits being churned out all the time. It's out with the old, in with the new. I worked with like the JCs, and they're like, why, are, why do we have all these young professional groups in town? That's what we do. Well, obviously, you are not giving them space to define what the groups mean for them. No. We have a pretty terrible way of talking about our young people. Right? The millennials, those entitled lazy millennials. I don't ever want to hear you say that. You all baby boomers, how were you talked about? Do you remember this? I'm Gen X, nobody cares about me. I'm in between the two, right? But meanwhile, but meanwhile, 
We have this kind of negative narrative about the lazy and title. And you see, there's covers of magazines here, like the me, the me decade, 20-something, generational warfare. It's all about me. It's all about me. The me thing, right? Like, who's selfish? 18-year-olds. This, this is not a trait of a generation. This is a trait of an age. Let people be selfish until they develop their own passion for their interests in their life. You are very challenged here in Nebraska. You have so many groups, it becomes a problem. This, this data point right here tells you how many people does every group or government agency have to look to in your county to find just one leader? One in nine people have to be involved as an elected or appointed leader or a board position in a nonprofit. So every time you think about creating a new group in your town, welcome to the competition. You, are, you have the seventh, seventh highest demand for leadership in the country. Like, so it's a double-edged sword, right? It's great that we've got all these groups, and as a sociologist, I love, because nonprofit groups are a reflection of who you are. Right? Nonprofits don't just get plopped into your county and then you start, like, oh, I guess we've got to run these, right? It starts with an interest. You've got an interest or a passion, you've got to find people to get together, and you get the articles of incorporation, you've got to hire a lawyer, you've got to copy and paste some language from somebody else's 501c3 paperwork. No, I mean, right? It's a lot of work to create groups, yet you're still creating groups in great numbers. What's shifted dramatically is how people want to be involved. Historically, people would be involved, involved in place-based groups with a broad focus, like the Hancock Community Betterment Club. Right? It, it pretty much only helped out Hancock, right? It didn't help out Cyrus right down the road. It was Hancock only, but they helped raise money or do activities for just about anybody in town, from raising money for the firemen or putting up a new school playground or doing whatever. Broad focus, narrow geography. Today, people want to be involved in just the opposite. Rather than a narrow geography, it's a broad geography. Rather than a broad focus, it's a narrow focus. The West Central Minnesota Snowmobile Association. They're not doing everything, they're snowmobiling and might have some auxiliary kind of things that they do. But this is the challenge to y'all. How do you connect with a group that engages a number of people in your county, but that organization doesn't actually live in your county? We live in the middle of everywhere. We live vast, wide, regional lives. So we, we're going to be doing this exercise later this afternoon at a breakout, but there's an exercise called living in the middle of everywhere, and you identify where you live, where you work, and then how far do you go out to shop and eat out? Because Lord knows I did not want to eat at Buddy's Bar and Grill in Hancock every time we ate out. We went in this huge region around our town, up to an hour away, to eat out and shop. And then how far do you go out to play? It's like two to three hours out. Your home is in the middle of all these things. So again, negative narrative, where do you live? I live in the middle of nowhere. Now how does this play out? How does this play out in a resident recruitment model and I'm looking to move into Shelby, right? They're not Shelby, but like I'm, gonna, I'm looking to move into Shelby. I run into the mayor and she's like, you're gonna love Shelby. We have like, uh, we've got this bar and grill on the side. We've got the elementary school here and our C store slash car sales slash deli slash hair cutter on the corner. <laughs> And I say, that's great, but I'm also looking at moving to Stromsburg. And then you're like, oh, you don't want to move there. They got nothing going on. Because we're really parochial about this. You want them in your town, right? So then you're kind of down. Now, well, now what did you just do? Not only did you downplay them, you downplayed yourself. Because now, why do I want to live in the middle of nowhere? You can't name off some of these regional assets I might actually come to appreciate. You can't give me a reason why I might want to live here. So we call this model resident recruitment model. It's, it's easily the most important thing we do in a tight labor market. And it's a confluence of economic development, community development, and tourism. Because not only do you have a number of people that commute out literally every day, a couple thousand people that commute out every day, you've got a couple thousand people that commute in, plus you've got all these visit visitors that come and go. But I'll remind you that you know, our county lines were drawn during a time of horse and buggy. We need to transcend those lines to help reflect the reality of real, rural, rural, regional lives. Do you include people in your planning that just work in your town? 
Like when we do community plans, I know you rarely don't, right? Right? I know when we do our plans, our community visioning in, in our small rural communities that we include the people that live there. Well, you've got people who are spending 8 to 10 to 12 hours a day in your town and also consider that their town. They want a voice. They have a concern for that place too, but are rarely included in our planning models. So the Pew Research Institute did a study a number of years ago that asked Americans, like, all right, Americans, we know that 80% of you live in a small town, or 80% of you live in a major metro or an urban place, and 20% of you live in a rural area or a small town, but if you could choose wherever you wanted to live, where would you live? 51% of Americans said they'd prefer to live in a small town in a rural place. Why don't they? I argue the narrative is so bad, they think they never could. Like, aren't you all dead? Right? I don't want to hang out in the post office. <laughs> there is actually a demand for rural and small town living. People are making the choice. Why is this more important now? The next 20 years are poised to be some of the most dramatic changes you've seen in your small towns. We talk about building for the future. This is it. Right now, 40%. 44% of homeowners in Garden County are over the age of 75. You ready for more than a third of your homes to turn over? On average, it's about 35% in our most rural places. A third, think about this, a third of your homes are owned by people over the age of 75. This is a whole nother ball game, this housing issue. Another 40% are baby boomers. So literally 75% of your homes are gonna turn over in the next 20 years. Are you ready for it? Are you ready to welcome in the next generation? Are you re ready and willing to hand over the realms of leadership? When we talk about the work you do at NCF and through NCF, it is about building for the future. And there is hope and opportunity for the future. People love living in our small towns. So for me, I want to shift the indicator for success from population, that total population fatuation, to homes. Your housing stock is a community asset. It was a home to previous generations. It's a home to a generation today, and hopefully will be a home to people in the future. And we talk about rural housing wealth. You talk about transfer of wealth studies. I want to talk about our transfer of homes, because if you don't have anywhere for people to live, who's going to hold the next generation of wealth in your towns? The number one audience for a negative narrative are your kids. Here are my kids, Kelvin and Truman. When you have a negative narrative in your town and they hear that there's nothing here for you, you need to get out to succeed. Our town used to be great, now it sucks. They hear this. They hear this. No. So people are making a choice. Of all the interviews and focus groups I've done, like if you want to hold on to a negative narrative, go ahead. You want to talk about where you, what you had or could have had or should have had, go ahead. But I'll remind you then, the thousands of interviews and focus groups I've done, nobody ever said they're moving to your town for pity. <laughs> I'm going to move to Shelby because I want to help you out. I know you lost your grocery store 28 years ago. <laughs> I'm here to help you out. Nobody ever says this. These newcomers are coming, they're creating groups, they're building their community, they're diversifying your economy, they're buying and starting businesses, they're working from home. Eight to 10% of your workforce is working from home right now. Do you even know where they are? Right? They're living in a region, they're more than warm bodies. The bottom line is, people want to live and move to your small towns for what you are today and will be tomorrow, not what may have been. Thank you. <laughs>